So when we're talking about the possibility of there being some type of interpersonal conflict, this can arise whenever two or more people are interacting. And in almost any situation in which people are together or interconnected in some way, there will always be the possibility for conflict. And of course, this can spill over into large scale conflict as well when you have large groups of people or crowds or even entire nations who are in conflict with one another. Much of the time, conflicts can be resolved peacefully, where members find solutions that are amicable to both parties or multiple parties, though oftentimes conflict can ultimately lead to open or overt hostilities as well, and these can make it much more difficult to find successful resolutions. One of the most common ways in which psychologists tend to study conflict is through the use of social dilemmas. And a social dilemma is a situation in which actions that are most beneficial to a singular individual are oftentimes not the most beneficial to the whole group. And those actions that are most beneficial to the whole group oftentimes do not maximize the gain or benefit that an individual could get. Now, one of the most common or perhaps most famous of the social dilemmas is called the prisoner's dilemma. And this is used in psychological research quite extensively, along with being used a lot in marketing as well. And while the example goes or is used oftentimes to illustrate with two prisoners being interviewed and they're being encouraged to sort of, I guess, rat the other one out where you are or pinning blame on them, I should say. And the idea here is that if you pin blame on your compatriot, then you will be given a deal and you will get a lesser sentence than originally expected, but they will get a much harsher sentence. Of course, the dilemma here is that if both of you stay silent, chances are both of you will get some time, but not too much of it though. Whereas if both people ultimately give up the other one, then both people will spend an extended amount of time in jail. And so here is just a, a standard contingency square showing these different options. Here, if prisoner A and prisoner B both remain silent, both of them will only spend two years in jail. Whereas if prisoner A remains silent, but prisoner B confesses, then prisoner B gets the deal, only goes to jail for one year. This is better for them overall. Whereas prisoner A will go to jail for eight years. Now, this is exactly the same, except if in this case, prisoner A had confessed and prisoner B had remained silent. And in this case, prisoner B gets the extended sentence, whereas prisoner A gets the deal. If both people confess, however, now both people end up going to jail for five years. Now, a lot of ways in which this is conducted with money will be something to the effect where if both people cooperate, both people get three cents, let's say, if one person takes the sort of confess route, whereas the other one doesn't, then the one who confesses or whatever the equivalent is, tends to get something like five cents or eight cents compared to the original three, whereas the other one gets only zero cents or something like this. So here one gets benefit, whereas the other tends to lose. But of course, if both people choose this competitive option, oftentimes here they're set up to lose several cents each. So the ideal is that both play cooperatively because over time they will accrue the maximum amount of money for the entire group, but not necessarily the individual. Oftentimes, unfortunately, what we see is that these situations devolve into competitive behavior fairly quickly. Of course, that is not true for everyone. Oftentimes in many of these situations, the two or more individuals who are taking part in these dilemmas are not allowed to communicate with one another or communication is severely restricted. Now, another type of dilemma that is often used in research are referred to as commons dilemmas. And these are oftentimes engaged in with multiple different people, oftentimes more than two. And these are meant to simulate situations in which people are partaking from the natural resources of the world, which are oftentimes called commons. And one of the most famous of these was originally put forward by a person with the last name of Hardin. And the idea here is that you have four pastoralists who have some cows and they're all grazing their cows on one field. Now it is to the benefit of any one of those farmers 
to maximize the amount of time that they let their cows graze on this field. Because the more time they spend the cows grazing, the more the cows can eat, the more they can convert that grass into muscle mass, and the more ultimately meat that those farmers can then sell or use for themselves. Now the problem arises when all four farmers take part in this activity. And if all four of them were to allow their cows to graze the maximal amount, then they would end up eating most of the grass and not leaving enough for the grass to repopulate. And ultimately that pasture would fall into disuse. And this is something that is commonly seen across many human societies and how we tend to use resources. Even though we have quite a history of being able to successfully manage forests and other natural resources, we also tend on many cases to overextend the amount that we draw from them. This is something that is seen in oceans and forests and agricultural land and so forth, where oftentimes people are trying to maximize the gain they can get from it. And oftentimes this results in those commons collapsing. So you can see how this is commonly used for psychologists when they're trying to study decision making, especially in group situations where conflict is common. And of course, in this case, it need not just be conflict across different members, but even the conflict that arises while people are attempting to make a decision that puts their own welfare in odds with the welfare of the entire group. Now, social dilemmas don't always result in conflict, however, and there are several ways to encourage that people act more cooperatively. One of the most fundamental ways in which this happens is if people are engaged in these situations with people that they know or are close to us, so family, friends, acquaintances, so on and so forth, people tend to engage in much more cooperative behavior than when they are engaged in these dilemmas with strangers. They will also tend to act more cooperatively when they are engaged in these types of situations with people that they know they will be interacting with in the future. And the more likely it is that they will be interacting with these people in the future, the more likely it is that they are going to operate cooperatively. And this is thought to largely be just a matter of how we socially present ourselves and taking advantage of other people while is sometimes encouraged behind closed doors is oftentimes not considered an open or publicly displayable sort of course of action. Another way in which to promote cooperative behavior in social dilemmas is by changing the context of those situations. One study found that if you label a Wall, I mean, a prisoner dilemma type game as the Wall Street game, only about a third of people will engage in cooperative behaviors. Yet if you have exactly the same game except give it the label of the community game, the degree of cooperation goes up to almost two thirds or a little bit more of participants acting cooperatively. And even though the game is the same with the same payouts and penalties, just changing the name of the game and setting up a different set of schemas that people are following can lead to a dramatic increase in cooperative behavior. This is something that is often discussed in real life situations where a lot of contexts in which conflict arises are thought to be zero sum games in which there are some winners and some losers. And some people have argued that this framing of many of the conflicts across the world actually encourages that conflict to continue to take place, as opposed to perceiving many of these problems as collective action problems that could be solved only if one had collective effort from many of the nations and groups on this planet. It doesn't actually change the problems themselves, but it could change the way in which people approach them. Another way in which to increase cooperation in these types of dilemmas is to use something called a tit for tat strategy. And in this, the way it works is your first move is always cooperative, giving the impression, at least to the other person, that you are willing to act in a cooperative way. But following this, one always responds in the manner that the opponent did on the previous trial, meaning that if after you on the first trial act cooperatively and they act competitively, then you on the next trial do so as well. And if they were to act cooperatively, then you do so as well. And ultimately, this leads to, at least the theory goes, the impression forming in the other person's mind that you are willing to act cooperatively from your first option, but you are also not willing to be taken advantage of with the sake of not letting them always choose what is best for them 
and you absorbing the cost of this to maintain the sort of collective feasibility of the group. Finally, this is not so much relevant for the prisoner's dilemma itself, but when you have large scale real conflicts that mirror these types of situations, oftentimes allowing individuals to make decisions will lead to much more effective decision making and resolution of conflict than having groups making decisions. And this is largely due to how groups tend to become polarized and they will over exacerbate the degree of competitiveness that is brought into this because a lot of times that is one of the norms that many groups carry, especially when they're trying to resolve conflict. And because that norm is present, the group will tend to exacerbate this norm and lead to increased competitive behavior as opposed to allowing one member to be sort of the representative of either group and allowing them to engage in this type of conflict and hopefully lead to resolution. A topic that often comes up when talking about conflict is threats. And threats are actually thought oftentimes to be quite effective ways to reduce conflict. This is a fairly common schema that many people actually still hold today, be it parents threatening children to comply with their wishes or one company or nation threatening another so that they comply with the wishes of that original company or nation. Research, however, has largely shown that threats tend to be ineffective and at worst, they tend to actually escalate tensions and conflicts between the parties that are involved. Some empirical examples to show this come from Deutsch and Krauss in the 1960s, where they have a paper called The Effects of Threat Upon Interpersonal Bargaining. And so in this case, there are three different conditions that were used, a condition in which there was no threat, a condition in which there was a unilateral threat, meaning one of the two parties was able to apply the threat condition, and then bilateral threats in which both could apply this threat. There were 16 pairs or dyads in each of these three conditions. Now, the way this situation worked is you had two fictitious companies, an Acme company and a Bolt company, and their goal was to transport goods from their start point to the end point. So Bolt would start here and move over to here, whereas Acme would start here and move over here. Now, each of the participants were told that they would start with 60 cents a piece before every trip, and for every additional second that they took, they would lose one second. So if it took you only 10 seconds to make it to your destination, you would end up with a profit of 50 cents. So now, of course, moving from your start position going up and then taking this one lane road would be the most effective way to reach your solution because it is the shortest distance to travel. Whereas on average moving across this lengthy path, which even though it might look a little bit different are actually measured to be exactly the same length, would result in a guaranteed loss of, I think they said between 20 and 30 cents per trip if they were take this extended route. Of course, both cannot travel through this condition because it is a one lane road. And if both trucks try and take this, they will end up head to head and one of them will have to reverse. These two lines represent the gates. So the gate closer to the start point is controlled by Acme and the gate closer to Bolt is controlled by Bolt. And so the way this worked is in the no threat condition, no one had access to these gates. Of course, both people could park their trucks in the middle of this road if they so felt like it. In the unilateral threat condition, Acme could shut this gate to prevent Bolt from using this route whenever they so chose, but Bolt had no such equivalent option. Of course, in the actual conditions when this happened and Acme tended to use this oftentimes, Bolt would simply just park a car or truck right in front of it, ultimately stopping Acme from using this road as well. In the bilateral threat condition, both people had access to their gates and could prevent the use of this one lane road. Now, I have just included this here because remember that this was done in the 1960s and there was actually no real computers being used in psychological experiments at this time. So here actually were countdown timers indicating how much money they still had left. There were various lights to show whether the various gates were closed or open and which ones those happened to be, along with a little controller that allowed them to choose whether the truck was moving forward or backwards, 
and then a selector button to allow them to choose different routes upon which they could travel. I just thought it's pretty unbelievable that these experimenters built these little box contraptions that had a whole bunch of little mechanisms inside to keep this working in order to facilitate this type of experiment. So moving on to the actual results of this. Now, it was found that in the unilateral, or I mean, excuse me, in the no threat condition, people actually performed the best, meaning that they arrived at maximum profit for both individuals. As soon as threats were introduced, their performance began to suffer. So here in the top solid line that you see here is the no gate condition where neither of them had access to controlling the gates. And you can see that overall they made a median income of about 10 cents in the beginning. And this slowly increased to a little bit above past 20 cents per trip that they took. And so this is combined for both of them. Of course, this is the median that both of them got. So that middle point. The dashed line right below here is the one gate condition where the Acme company was able to close the road, whereas Bolt did not have this power, even though they could park their truck in the way. And you can see here that even though their performance begins to get better and approaches the no threat condition, there is a much rockier road in the middle where this makes up a lot of where Acme is trying to use its gate and Bolt is oftentimes simply just parking the truck in the way, preventing Acme from using that route. And of course, in the situation of two gates, which is seen here, performance is pretty disastrous. At best, they still end up losing about 20 cents per trip per person when they're able to both use threats with each other. And this just goes to show you that in conditions where one is able to threaten one another in an effort to resolve conflict, it rarely tends to work. Just for some added information, a second replication of this was conducted two years later, in which they then added a extra condition that allowed the two participants to communicate with each other over an intercom. And the idea here was that through communication, it would be more like a real life conflict. And therefore, this was likely to hopefully help with the resolution of this type of situation. Unfortunately, this is not actually what happened, and much of the time they spent communicating actually was no different than them threatening each other with gates, and it did not actually improve performance significantly, especially in the threat conditions. However, when they were taught, I suppose, or it was explained to them how they could have successful conflict resolution communication across their intercoms, this was found to dramatically improve their performance in this type of task. Ultimately, this and many other studies have shown that in conflict situations, threats are largely useless. I mean, not necessarily even useless, but detrimental to the end goal of solving problems. Finally, there's negotiation. And negotiation refers to any type of communication between opposing sides or parties in a conflict in which one just offers offers, <laughs> offers, offers, and counter offers in a manner of trying to get to a solution that is equitable or agreeable to both parties. Now, one of the biggest hurdles to negotiation of any type is that people oftentimes assume in conflict there will be one winner and one loser, and people don't want to be the loser, they would prefer to be the winner, and so they will take great pains to become the winner, and this mentality can oftentimes be a great hurdle when it comes to trying to negotiate successfully across conflict. Now, on that note, they are oftentimes what are called integrative solutions. And integrative solutions are solutions to any type of conflict, again, used in negotiation, where parties make trade-offs on specific issues, where if two parties have preferences about what they would like, instead of just arguing over everything, they easily give up things that they don't much care about, and they ask for things that they care about much more. One thing that is often found in these types of situations is that people have different desires for the specific items that they care about. And much of the time, what one party cares about is not necessarily something the other party cares about. So identifying these topics and giving on topics one does not care much about and taking on topics one does care about oftentimes allows one to come to much better agreeable situations in negotiation. 
So some tips for successful negotiations is to just always keep in mind that integrative solutions oftentimes exist. This can often only be found when people are willing to discuss what things they actually care about having and which things are not as relevant to them. This allows people to actually make sort of a ranking of what things matter the most. So it could well be that some people care about getting video games and the television, whereas the other person doesn't really care about those two things, and they would much rather have all of the books and the drafting table. There's no need to have a strong conflict when people actually want two different things from a dissolution. Another factor that helps a lot with negotiations is fostering trust across negotiations. So as I mentioned before, oftentimes in conflict situations, people really believe it to be a situation in which there is one winner and one loser, and it is very hard to establish trust when one believes that only one of you can win. By establishing trust across the divide, oftentimes this can dampen this type of mentality and this allows people to one, come to more integrative solutions more effectively and two, realize that it's possible for both people to get some of the things that they want and no longer be stuck in this notion that there can only be one winner and one loser. Additionally, many studies have shown that negotiating in person for the large part is actually one of the most effective ways to negotiate because it tends to foster trust at a much higher rate than communicating through electronic media. Though this is not always beneficial, when two people are highly aroused, it is oftentimes very difficult for them to engage in successful negotiation. Another matter that increases the odds of successful negotiation is communication styles. A lot of times, again, when one is trying to win, Oftentimes we will hide certain pieces of information because the idea that knowledge is power, especially when it's secret, and this will prevent us from communicating openly and honestly, and this can actually hamper the ability to find integrative solutions. And so one effective way to have good negotiation is to just directly communicate openly what things one wants and what things one doesn't really want, and this allows the other party to know and not only evaluate what things are important to you and what things are important to them, but it also builds trust. Because oftentimes, even though we don't always want to hear something that is said directly, so long as it's not said in a rude manner, at the end of the day, this is often one of the most effective ways to build trust. Finally, remembering that people often have different perspectives than you. Not everybody sees the same world that you do when you look out. Even though the physical reality is probably the same, we all perceive it differently. And so expecting others to see the world just like you do will oftentimes come at your own peril. Additionally, remembering that just because you see this world a certain way, that other people won't necessarily see the same. Not everybody will automatically know your perspective either. So it behooves you to take time to communicate openly about the way in which you see things and want things, because this allows people to know what perspective you are coming from. Ultimately, all of these things can help tremendously when it comes to resolving negotiation. And even though many of them are quite straightforward, they don't often get used. And this is again, largely because I said, there's a high encouragement of using this ideology of they are winners and they are losers, and that is often not conducive to successful negotiation.